Hello guys, we're back with these guys. I hardly have any will to live anyways, so we might as well. But first, let's skip the skit. I don't know why they do it, but it adds nothing to the conversation and is completely extraneous. Eventually, they get to the point where they're talking about Pangea. Right here, they believe all the continents were together to form Pangea 225 million years ago. But not everyone agrees, right? Virtually everyone agrees. True. Thousands of scientists believe in fast continental sprint rather than slow continental drift. Maybe creation scientists, but are they really scientists, though? One famous scientist by the name of Dr. John Baumgartner. Famous? I've never heard of him. Let's look him up. Oh, he's a creation scientist. Look at that. It's kind of odd how all of the alleged evidence that you're giving me comes from people who already had the preconceived notion that your god exists. But I suppose that's alright. I mean, there's nothing about an intense bias that would make people think that he wasn't a credible scientist. So let's keep going. Created a computer model for plate tectonics that thousands of geophysicists use to investigate Earth processes. His model has given us an understanding of how the continents split apart thousands not millions of years ago. So his evidence for how the world works around us is that he made something with his computer. In 1997, the US News and World Report reported Terra was created by a Los Alamos lab scientist the world's preeminent expert in the design of computer models for geophysical convection. Well, it's funny that you cite that article because in that article it says, Among geologists, there is universal agreement that Baumgartner's views are simply wrong. Well, shit. The article goes on to berate and bombard Baumgartner's bombastic beliefs. And apparently, he is known in the Los Alamos community as a Christian rabble-rouser. Didn't he show that they can also move very quickly? Yes, he did actually show that if just about everything that we know about the world was completely different in the past, then that sort of thing might not be impossible. Right, but because the theory of evolution takes a long period of time to supposedly happen, many only accept uniformitarian ideas. This principle states that the same processes that operate today operated in the past. Oh yes, of course. That is the only reason why we have such a concept. Not because it makes sense or anything. But what this principle refuses to take into account is the major catastrophic events of the past. That is a lie. While this concept may not have a lot to do with catastrophic events, geologists definitely do take catastrophic events into consideration. And in fact, they can even see evidence of catastrophic events, of which there are none for a worldwide flood. Okay, well, during the 1980s eruptions at Mount St. Helens, 200 layers of rock were deposited in three hours. Entire river systems were carved in a matter of months, right through 700 feet of hard rock. <laughs> no, no it wasn't, because that wasn't hard rock, that was unconsolidated volcanic ash, which is incredibly easy to erode. Whereas something like the Grand Canyon is made of actual hard rock, like limestone, sandstone, and metamorphic rocks. Not to mention the fact that the slope of Mount St. Helens makes it much easier for it to erode, and the river systems that formed after Mount St. Helens had a slope of about 45 degrees, whereas the Grand Canyon is pretty vertical. Examples like this cause geologists to rethink some of their previous ideas. It's funny how you say examples like this, as if there are any more examples, because this is the one and only example like this that I've heard from creationists. So imagine what a worldwide flood would do. Exactly. What? No. If the entire world flooded, that wouldn't create hundreds of rock layers. 200 layers of rock. It would create one rock layer. And even if it did form rock layers, it wouldn't form several different layers of the same kind of rock. There would only be one layer of limestone in the Grand Canyon, where there are several in between other layers. Not only that, but canyons are few and far between. If a worldwide flood did cause the Grand Canyon, wouldn't we see lots more Grand Canyon? Canyons? Why would it affect that area more than other areas? But let's think about this. The whole world flooded, right? Well, where did all of that water come from? Seriously, because apparently it rained long enough for the entire Earth to be covered, but there isn't anywhere near enough water in our biosphere to cover the Earth. But let's say that it did flood. Let's say that the rain was God's tears or something. Where did the water go? Seriously, according to the Bible, the water just receded, as if it wasn't a big deal. The answer, of course, is the fact that ancient Hebrews had a completely different model of the universe than we do today, but but I guess let's just ignore that. These rock layers in the Grand Canyon were laid down over millions of years and were then slowly washed away by the river, forming a channel. That's uniformitarian thinking again, isn't it? Yep, 
If these rock layers took millions of years to form, then the bottom rock layers would be hard and brittle by the time the ones at the top would be deposited. But near Grand Canyon, all the layers are bent together. If they were bent together, well, they were hard. Snap! The rocks didn't shatter like they should have. They must have been bent together while they were soft and pliable. The whole stack. That means they were all deposited about the same time. Not over millions of years. All of that is wrong. First of all, it wouldn't snap. It wouldn't shatter. It would fracture, as is shown in your picture, right there and there. You just showed evidence that these things were brittle when they were moved. And here's some more fractures within the Grand Canyon, from a blog of somebody who's an actual geologist. But even if it didn't fracture, that just means that it was all pliable in some way. See, rock layers can actually move between one another, becoming longer or shorter in any direction. And recrystallizations also help formations resist fracturing. So what about the canyon itself? Well. If the river slowly carved the canyon, then we should see all the material piled up in a river delta. But it's completely missing. In fact, about 1,000 cubic miles has been eroded to form the Grand Canyon. Where did it all go? If the canyon was slowly eroded by the Colorado River, an enormous delta should be found at the mouth of the river where it empties into the Gulf of California. But the delta only contains about 1% of the eroded material we would expect if the evolutionary explanation were true. Well, we do have over 10,000 miles of sediment in the delta from the last two to three million years. Sediment older than that has shifted along faults, and sediments have also accumulated along the floodplains before the delta. And that's not to mention the fact that wind also erodes the Grand Canyon, and that the Grand Canyon contains rocks like limestone and dolomite. These rocks don't actually leave any sediment, but instead dissolve. They go on to talk about fossils because apparently, unless everything floods everywhere, it's impossible for organisms to be buried quickly. I don't understand it and quite frankly it's a waste of my time. But she also mentions soft tissue and dinosaur bones, which quite frankly I can't be bothered to address. So here's a link to a point in one of Professor Styx's videos where he covers this a little bit better than I would have. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it?